Hello everybody. In this lesson, I'm going to continue the topic of rotation of rigid particles in viscous flows. Let us review the behavior of spheroids in modern clinic flows. A differential equation for the rotation of rigid objects can be solved analytically if the flow field is a modern clinic one. The velocity gradient tensor can be expressed by a matrix like this. So the flow is defined in a coordinate system x, y, z. The shear direction is parallel to y axis. So the shear strain rate is gamma dot. The strain rate parallel to the x, y, and z axis are respectively epsilon x dot, epsilon y dot, and epsilon z dot. The orientation of the distinct axis of a spheroid is defined by theta, it's a trend of the axis, and phi, that is the tilt of the axis. This is a stereographic projection of the coordinate geometry. The flu field can be described by three dimensionless parameters. The sectional kinematic vorticity number, Ws, which can be recast by a theta angle, theta r. Lambda, that is the ratio of the kinematic vorticity number, the sectional kinematic vorticity number, divided by the shape factor b. And the third dimensionless parameter is z, that is the ratio of the strain rate along the vorticity axis, epsilon z dot, divided by the shear strain rate. With this set up, the equation can be solved and the history for theta is described by these composite equations. Depending on the parameter of lambda squared, the expressions are here. The equation for theta evolution is this one. Today I'm going to concentrate more on prorate in simple shearing flows because these are the most studied situation and understanding more thoroughly the behavior of prolate in simple shearing flows will help us understand the behavior of rigid body rotation in general. So in a simple shearing flow, a prolate object follows what is called the Jeffrey orbit. The distinct axes of a prolate object rotate around the vorticity axis following elliptical orbits. This is the equal area stereographic projection of the path. These orbits are characterized by orbit constant c. c equals zero means the object is always parallel to the vorticity. When c is infinity, the object's distinct axis is on the vorticity normal section and C is defined by the initial orientation of the prolate object. The theta expression is expressed here. Rp here is the aspect ratio, which for prolate object, Rp is greater than 1, and for oblate object, Rp is less than 1. So Rp is really another recast of the shape factor of the object. So the shape factor B is defined by this. The periodicity of these orbits are here because these functions are periodic. Periodicity can be either represented by T or can be by a shear strand, gamma P, one periodic rotation of the object. So for one gamma P, the object has finished one complete rotation. Of course, gamma p is related to the shape of the object. Predictions based on Jeffrey's equations have been confirmed by many experiments and a theoretical analysis. The first experimental confirmation of Jeffrey's result was published in 1923, one year past the publication of Jeffrey's paper itself. Some of these publications are in geology journals. Gaussian-Ramberg is a two-dimensional special case. Willis 
published the paper in 1977 in GSA Bulletin, and a more recent publication is in Journal of Structural Geology. So these results, experimental results, and the theoretical analysis all confirm Jeffrey's prediction. Bratton particularly has shown that the rotation in simple shear for a rigid body of revolution, so it doesn't have to be a spheroid. It can be any rigid body as long as it has the symmetry of revolution. So the behavior of a rigid body of revolution is mathematically identical to that of an equivalent spheroid. Only the parameter b needs to be described by an effective parameter. So if the object is not a spheroid but a an object of revolution, then instead of using the actual aspect ratio, we use an effective aspect ratio. You can imagine that if we are dealing with a rectangular body, you can imagine that the equivalent ellipse is something like this. The aspect ratio of the real object is a long axis divided by the short axis. In the rectangular one is A divided by C. The equivalent or best fit ellipse for that is the long dimension is 2r and the short dimension is 2 small r. Of course, r divided by small r is different from a divided by c. And depending on whether the object is an elongated one, it's a rod like, or it's a flattened one, like a disc like, the effective aspect ratio can be less or greater than the actual aspect ratio. So the point is, if the object is non-spheroidal, we can use an equivalent one. We can expand this concept to a general situation of non-ellipsoidal triaxial object. So for a non-ellipsoidal triaxial object, from the point of view of its rotation, it can be regarded as an equivalent ellipsoid. So now getting back to the behavior of prolate object in simple shear, Jeffrey orbits here. An object may rotate and it may approach a nearby object and the interaction of the object will change its rotational behavior. So you can imagine that when an object approach a nearby one, it will drift from one Jeffrey orbit to another one. And they will rotate at a, with a different behavior until they separate. When they separate, they might be now on a separate orbit. And this has been confirmed in many experiments. One may wonder where the rotation of these rigid objects leads to preferred orientations. In the simple situation, if we have a population of many prolate particles in a simple shear, will they evolve into a preferred orientation? The answer to that question is yes and no. Here is a numerical experiment based on 1,000 prolate particles, all of the same shape, 5 to 1 to 1. So they are all prolate identical shape. Initially, their orientations are uniformly distributed in three dimensions. On an equal area stereo net projection, the distribution is something like this. This is at the strength state of zero. Now, if the simple shear reaches one-eighth of gamma p, which is defined previously, so one gamma p is the shear strand, that is required for a prolate object to complete a Jeffrey orbit. So if the system strand is now one eighth of that, we have a preferred orientation defined by the population of particles. When the strand increases, this preferred orientation evolves. When the system strand is three eighths of gamma p, the preferred orientation has been rotated past the shear zone boundary. By the time the system strand is half of gamma p, the system returns to uniform distribution again. So, the preferred orientations do develop. However, this preferred orientation is not monotonic. Instead, the preferred orientation oscillates. It can intensify and then detensify, and it returns to uniform distribution again.
Of course, if rigid body is not spheroidal, or equivalently spheroidal, or if the flu field is not monoclinic, then the rotation problem cannot be solved analytically. So we are dealing with a problem that can be mathematically stated by this complete set of equations. So the rotation is described by this differential equation. The angular velocity is given by Jeffrey's work. If the rigid object can be regarded as an ellipsoid or an equivalent ellipsoid. And also we know the initial state, initial shape and orientation of the object. If we have these three conditions given, then we are able to use numerical approach to track the evolution of the rigid particle. In this course, we have been using MathCAD and the MATLAB. Now, MathCAD is really a very, very straightforward and easy to use software. So using MathCAD is like really doing math with a pen and paper. So it's truly what you see is what you get. You get fast evaluation of equations and the symbolic derivations from MathCAD. MATLAB is another alternative. It's more powerful than MathCAD and it has more visualization capabilities. In the rest of this lesson, I'm going to show you how we use a MathCAD program to numerically track the orientation evolution of any triaxial rigid ellipsoid. So let me open MathCAD. Okay, I've just opened a worksheet. It's called Jeffrey Single. So it's a single class of Jeffrey. Okay. This file is available for download in the course website. I will go very briefly with this worksheet so that you get familiar with application. It's pretty self-explanatory if you read through the annotations in this worksheet. So f, x, y, z is really a function. We define a function here. So this function is defined because I want to make use of this function to define the orientation of the object. So orientation of the object is defined by a matrix Q. So Q here is defined in terms of the three spherical angles of the object, x1, x2, x3. I've already defined fx, so I can make use of it. If you want to review the concept of a spherical angles and how they are related to the orientation matrix, please read relevant chapters in the lecture notes. These are other functions. Remember that the orientation of a line is defined by its theta angle and phi angle, and these angles are related to the unit vectors by these functions, and these functions, again, are given in the lecture notes. These are just additional rearrangement of these angles, arrange these into matrix forms so that the data are more organized. These two functions in MathCAD in this sheet are for stereographic for equal area projection. So the left one is for the projection in the Z positive hemisphere. If you like, it can be upper hemisphere. And this function is for Z negative hemisphere or if you like, it's a low hemisphere. When we're dealing with the rotation of triaxial objects, we must consider both the upper hemisphere and the low hemisphere. And here is the B is the shape factor. Again, read the lecture notes. Angular velocity for the ellipsoid, directly from Jeffrey's equation. So angular velocity is a vorticity term plus a shape term. The shape term is related to the strain rate component of the imposed flow. With that, we are able to calculate one increment of the orientation change. So given a small increment of time, the orientation is going to be changed. There's an incremental Q here. Q has to be updated to a new Q here. There are two ways we calculate this increment. These are different numerical methods. One is Rangikuda method, details in the lecture notes, and the other is called Rodrigue's approximation. 
I use different function names, incremental Q and incremental Q1. So we can use either of these and compare their computation results. Because we have to use a very, very small time increment, the intermediate increments can be many hundreds or many thousands. We do not need to output all the intermediate calculations. We can choose every 10 increments you produce, uh, we ask, an output. So this is what M is. These are the final result. We reorganize this final result. So basically, if you spend time going through this worksheet, you will learn a lot about the numerical methods. And it also gives you the opportunity to review many mathematical equations presented in previous sessions and also in the lecture notes. If you understand a worksheet like this one, you become familiar with this software. Input parameters include the velocity field. In the calculation of the worksheet, you need to define a parameter and evaluate the parameter before it can be used later on. However, if I use identical equation here, then it means wherever I assign it, it's going to be acknowledged globally. So I do not have to put L at the beginning of the spreadsheet, because if I put it at the beginning, it becomes inconvenient to see the output. So L is the velocity gradient. As you can see, this is the simple shear parallel to y axis. So the three diagonal terms, epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z dot, are all zero. You can give any flu field. It doesn't have to be modern clinic. x zero is a vector given as the initial orientation of the object. Three spherical angles. Remember, the orientation of a three-dimensional object is defined by three spherical angles, which is used in this worksheet. We have to choose a time increment for the calculation. So you want to choose a time step a increment that is sufficiently small that your results are accurate. Let's try an object. Long axis is 5, intermediate axis is 1, small axis is 1 as well with a time length of, let's say, 0.01. Our strain rate, shear strain rate is 1. So if I use 0.01, that means every increment represents 1% of shear strain. So you have to consider L and delta T together. If I do that, if I choose that, and the calculation is finished almost immediately, so this is the result of the calculation. Now you see this is the A1 axis. So A1 axis, it's a perfect Jeffrey orbit, 70,000. We don't need that many steps. But it tells us that even after many, many rounds of this calculation, it stays on a perfect Jeffrey orbit, which means the calculation is very, very accurate. You can ignore A2 axis and A3 axis because there is only one distinct axis. Now let's see we have an object. It is oblate. One axis is 5. The other axis is, let's say, 10, 10. See, we have the Jeffrey orbit. If we have triaxial objects, 3, 1. Now you see the a1 axis rotates here in the upper hemisphere counterclockwise with vorticity and then it reaches the low hemisphere, continuing in the low hemisphere, and then back to the upper hemisphere again. A2 axis always stay in the low hemisphere. A3 axis rotate counterclockwise again with vorticity and may reach the low hemisphere. That's a glimpse of the application of this software. The worksheet is available from the course website. I hope you will be able to download it and play with it and try to learn this mathematic software. And more important is to understand the numerical approach. A MATLAB version of this software is also given in the course website. The algorithm is identical, even though the competition is realized in these two different platforms. 
Okay, that is it for today. Thank you for your attention.